Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. My name's Donna Jones. I'm a concerned citizen. I'm not connected with any board within town. Um, I'm wondering how you heard about this meeting. Was it through email? I'd appreciate hand raising. Raise your hand if it was email. If it was newspaper. Okay. <laughs> if it was word of mouth. Facebook. Okay. So. We seem to cover a lot and reached a lot of people. We appreciate that. Um, our presenters today are Carolyn and Rand, uh, our longtime members of the 350 Massachusetts, a statewide network of volunteer climate activists with chapters that are called nodes that range from the Berkshires to the Cape, focusing on climate solutions within the state. Carolyn founded and ran the Central Massachusetts nodes for two years. Once Spectra proposed their gas infrastructure project in this area, she left the Central Mass node and started the 350 Mass Franklin node, Greater Franklin node, uh, to, in order to fight against Spectra, the, the Spectra project. Um, Rand is a physics, has a physics degree uh, currently works at IBM as a software engineer. His first job out of college with, uh, with a, a gas and oil consulting firm uh, doing energy forecasts uh, ironically prepared him well for the volunteer climate work he does today. Um, so I think the format is you'll do your presentation, we'll take questions, this is being video recorded for Norfolk Community Television. They have provided paper and pens over there and their big purple general business card. You're welcome to use them. And um, it will be available later on TV and on the web under YouTube. And um, so when we get to the question point, I will try my best to get you a microphone so it can be heard on the recording. Thank you, Carolyn and Rand. Thank you so much for coming. I am just stunned. You all are absolutely awesome. <laughs> I, I just love how much you have, you are, you've taken the time out of your lives to come and find out about this because you, re you recognize that there's a real possibility here of impacting your town in a major way. So I really, oh my gosh, I'm just stunned. I, all right, I will, t I will talk louder. Okay, this, this, this I, I can, all right, I can project more, that's fine. This microphone is only for the, the, uh, the cable station. It is not for the use of this building, this room. So I'll just throw my voice out. Okay, first of all, there are a couple of things. Um, there is the, uh, the, a possibility of Norfolk to be able to sign as an intervener uh, with the FERC process. Uh, and it would be a useful thing to do because it gives uh, the, the town of Norfolk, if they agree to do this, it gives, the, gives you legal rights that you ordinarily would not have during the FERC process later on uh, uh, that if you don't sign up, you don't get. So uh, there, there is a petition here to be able to um, uh, asking for signatures. If you, want, if you feel comfortable signing this, that would be great. Um, it would show the level of interest to the, to, uh, the uh, selectmen, and that's useful for them to know, to be able to feel that there are concerned citizens, and they want uh, are you, they want, and you want them to protect your town and take care of of your your property and all the the whole community. Um, there's also a a flyer. Uh, that is a good all-purpose flyer that we um, give a lot of background. Some, there, some of the things that are in this article, or in this flyer, you'll see some of the, the same information here. So if you need to understand something more than once, hear it more than once or read it, this is a way to take care of most of the, the, the big bullet points that we talk about tonight. And then there's also um, a, an art, a, a map of uh, Norfolk, and it shows the uh, projected um, evacuation 
uh, zones. So um, there, all of those are over on the side there. And if you can, when you have, if you haven't signed up, please do sign up afterwards. And um, because I would love to be able to include you. Um, you know, people in Norfolk need to would like to be able to work with each other, as well as. Um, uh, as well as I would love to be able to let you know of other things that are coming down the road that al also are happening in other towns and that sort of thing. Um, you know, so, you know, there, are, please, if, and if you have a real difficulty with, um, with your legibility, I ask that you uh, provide a phone number because if I can't, Reach, if I don't, can't read your writing on your, your email address, then you're not going to get an email. Uh, so uh, at least I, if I have a phone number, I have some recourse to be able to try to reach you and find out uh, how to get that information to you. So, uh, so I'm Carolyn Barthel, my husband ran, and let's start the, the project. So what is Spectra? It's a Houston-based interstate pipeline company that operates gas pipelines across the United States. And Spectra is just, as of very recently, merging with a Canadian pipeline company called Enbridge, which is very focused on the export market. Uh, this is the current route. Um, you can see Norfolk right in the middle. Uh, this is, there are many, multiple pieces to the Access Northeast project. Uh, this is called, uh, the, the piece that's called the uh, Q1 loop. And there are other parts of the project that are, um, there's a West Boylston lateral. So the, so the um, Q1 loop goes from Medway all the way over to Stoughton East. And uh, the West Boylston lateral goes from Medway um, north, uh, uh, west and mostly north up to uh, West Boylston, uh, just north of Worcester. Uh, so, and then there are other pieces there. There's a proposed um, compressor station in Weymouth, a proposed com a compressor station in Rehoboth, and two LNG uh, storage tanks that each one would be the size of Gillette Stadium, and that would be in Rehoboth. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. In a, uh, in a cushion, the one 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 compressor station in in Weymouth and the other compressor station in Rehoboth. Okay. Um, this is a, a slide from the Spectra website. It's it says Atlantic Bridge on there, but it's I'm I'm putting it in because as you'll see as we go down go through this process. Um, there are multiple pieces of this of this project all under Spectra and the, um, under their effort. And they are, um, uh, and I'm including this one. This was the, Atlantic Bridge was preceding Access Northeast, uh, but it, um, they made no bones about the fact that it was, it's called uh, Atlantic Bridge. What does that say to you? Atlantic Bridge. It's gonna be a bridge to export gas someplace else. Um, uh, mostly, most likely Europe. Um, uh, but this time, you know, for Access Northeast, they've had a different take on it, and so they're saying, oh, this is not for export, but uh, this is all, these are all pieces of the same project, essentially, even though they have different names. Go ahead. And, oh, and, that, and, the, and the one, and it's, so the current, Current possibility for export is that it would uh, there are existing pipelines that go up through Canada, and uh, there would be LNG export terminals in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. So the specifications for the Q1 loop are a 30-inch pipeline um, steel pipeline. Um, the operating pressure is 750 pounds per square inch, and that's the that's a really important piece because it's really high pressure. It's a transmission line. It's not a distribution line. A little, you know, one of those little little pipes that comes to your house to give you gas. This is 700. That's 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 only just you know maybe even not a pound of pressure, but this is 750 pounds of pressure. It's a lot. Go ahead. Um, these are the towns that are affected by the Q1 loop: um, Milford, Bellingham, you know, and going going further east: Medway, Franklin, Millis, Norfolk, Walpole, Sharon, Canton, and Stoughton. Um, and Medway has the 
dubious honor of being the origin of both pipelines. Um, it's on either side of the, the Exxon, uh, Exxon power plant. Uh, here's a pipeline route through Norfolk. You can see the evacuation zone. Uh, you have your own map um, that uh, we have uh, provided. And so, you know, the, the, for a pipeline that is 30 inches in diameter, and it's 750 parts per square mil, parts, uh, I'm sorry, pounds per square inch. Ah, pounds per square inch. Um, that means that the evacuation zone is about a um, hundred and, wait a minute, no, 200, about 200 miles, 200, 200 feet on either side. So, no, that's, that's 16 inches. That's a, the, this, this, for, this is a 30 inch pipeline, and so it is, it is nearly 2,000 feet on either side. So it's three quarters of a mile in diameter, in, in across, in width. Yeah. In case you can't read this, this is the Millis side on the left. This is River Road in the area of the uh, Norfolk Ice Arena. The pipe is already there at the back of their parking lot. And then this is Route 115 at Holbrook Street, the village at River's Edge, and Pin Oaks area. And it, <coughs> it continues and crosses over Seekonk Street. And this, this is Boardman Street. And the Freeman Kennedy Elementary School is about there. Um, Boardman Street, you'll um, behind Campbell Street, near the railroad tracks, and then we're into Walpole. So if you're wondering, well, do you, where is it? I've never seen it. Look for the yellow pipe coming out of the ground. That means that it's natural gas. Some people call them candy sticks. You know, um, so um, let's keep going. So uh, Rand is now going to talk about how Spectra Access Northeast is being justified. Okay, uh, let's see, I'm gonna see if I can, I may need this uh, in a minute. So, uh, hi everybody. Um, uh, <clears throat> so, um, the uh, official rationale for this project is to provide more natural gas for electricity generation. Um, and the, uh, and, and the, um, uh, th the people who are promoting this, which is basically um, uh, the pipeline companies, the utility companies, and, and uh, Governor Baker and other institutional energy actors in the state, um, they uh, po will point to the, uh, the so-called polar vo vortex winter of 2013-2014 um, when we saw uh, a, an extremely cold winter at a time when there were also many uh, unusual demands on the natural gas supply throughout the United States. And we saw uh, price spikes in the, both electricity and gas, uh, which, uh, which both went up dramatically uh, when the pipelines reached the point where it was not possible to draw the gas from the pipelines fast enough to keep up with the demand. And so the, the argument is that a basic argument that is being made for this project is that we need to uh, have more pipeline capacity so we can, uh, so we can um, uh, keep the gas coming to the power plants. Uh, and so that's, that's basically what you may have heard this uh, sort of under the general heading of we need the gas coming from various sources of marketing and messaging that, that those institutions have, and I think there have been um, advertisements on TV and other sources. Um, so, okay, so we'll move on. So now, who are the players in this? So we have the Spectra Pipeline Company itself, which is a Houston-based uh, interstate pipeline company. They operate pipelines all over the country. Uh, also, the, ma the two major utility companies, companies in, uh, in Massachusetts, Eversource and National Grid, uh, which have uh, actually formed a partnership with Spectra. There's a consortium to build this pipeline that Spectra owns part of and National Grid owns part of and Eversource owns part of. Um, 
Then there is the, 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 the organization that is called ISO New England, the independent system operator of New England. They are the organization that manages the production of electricity. They, they're the people who figure out which power plants to turn on when to uh, keep the electricity coming as demand goes up and down. And that's really all they do. They're only focused on, on dispatching uh, sources of electric power as needed. Uh, and then the Department of Public Utilities has been supportive of this project, and so has Governor Baker. Uh, okay. Now, until recently, the, the plan that all of these institutional players had among themselves to pay for this pipeline, this pipeline is very expensive. It's $3 billion, uh, and that's, you know, before any cost overruns that, happen, that might happen. Um, the plan was to have us, the electric electricity ratepayers of the state, uh, pay for this pipeline through a surcharge on our electric utility bills, something that we have been referring to in our, in our uh, discussions as a pipeline tax. Uh, essentially, even, you would pay for the pipeline even if you do not personally use natural gas. Um, however, uh, on, uh, in August, the Supreme Judicial Court um, ruled in a lawsuit that was brought by the Conservation Law Foundation that this uh, usage of an electricity surcharge to pay for a gas pipeline was illegal under existing utility regulation law. And you can, you can charge electricity customers for, um, for electricity infrastructure as it's built. You can charge gas customers for gas infrastructure as it's built, but you can't crisscross between the two. And this was effectively de declared to be an illegal attempt to declare a piece of gas infrastructure to be a piece of electricity infrastructure. So right now, we're in a sort of a holding period while we're kind of waiting for Spectra and National Grid and Eversource to figure out what their next move is because this considerably complicates how they're going to pay for this project. Uh, and it also complicates uh, how they will justify the project to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which is the federal regulatory body that regulates gas pipelines. So, you know, so our suspicion, however, is that one way or another, they will try to find a way to, perhaps an indirect way, to have us pay for as much of this pipeline as they possibly can, uh, because their, their recourse would be to raise money on their own through the capital markets, through bonding and other uh, funding sources, and, and that would mean they're taking on all of the risk. So, uh, all right, so the, the, let's talk a little bit about the real problem that we're, that we're dealing with here when we talk about security of electricity supply. The real issue here is not that, that ongoingly there is not enough gas pipeline capacity to bring enough gas up here to make electricity. The real problem is that for, there is a period of time, mainly in the deep winter, when sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, if it gets very cold, the combined demand to make electricity and the demand to keep homes and buildings heated and keep, keep uh, stoves cooking and everything, all of that demand can add up to uh, a rate of electricity, of, of gas uh, use that is more than what the pipeline that it, pipelines that exist can deliver. Now when that happens, uh, a number of things happen to take up the slack. Uh, to some extent we have we have uh, uh, stored, there is, there is gas that is stored as a liquefied natural gas in various storage facilities uh, in the state. So some of that comes online. Um, natural gas can be imported from overseas as liquefied natural gas. Also, uh, electricity can be generated through uh, power plants that don't burn natural gas. Uh, you'll, you'll see power plants being started up that burn diesel fuel. Um, and uh, used to be that, uh, that they would actually start up coal plants as well. Uh, that will not be uh, happening in the future because all of the coal plants in the state are being shut down. Um, so basically, we have, we're in this situation because we have a very cold winter and 
uh, and the, uh, the state relies on natural gas to generate about 60% of its electricity. So it, we're very gas dependent. And this chart actually kind of illustrates the, the, the situation. This is, a, uh, this is actually a, a, a forecast. Um, uh, this came from the, uh, uh, a, a study that was commissioned of this electricity security issue uh, by the Conservation Law Foundation. And uh, what you're looking at here, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this fancy laser pointer. This is something I haven't done before. Uh, what you're seeing here is uh, daily gas demand uh, for a year, and this is, this is a forecast for 2020, showing, uh, and all the days of the year, all 365 days, are sorted in order of decreasing gas demand. So highest gas demand over here, this is, this is daily gas demand in a unit called decatherms, um, which don't worry about what that is, it's just a unit of heat energy. Uh, and so what this, this green line here represents the combined capacity of all of the pipelines coming into the region. This is for the all of New England, this isn't just, um, just Massachusetts. And so what you see is that, so there is this, this, this period of about uh, 30 or 40 days when it is possible for demand to exceed pipeline deliverability. Uh, and that's the, that's the time when the other sources of energy get, get dispatched and, and uh, uh, potentially prices can go up and so forth. As you see, for most of the year, there is slack capacity in the pipeline system. And, and in fact, so now the, the Spectra uh, Access Northeast project that we are uh, talking about here would raise this green line basically up to where this gray line is. That's the amount of extra pipeline capacity it would add. And as you can see, it would get rid of most of this little toe portion of the curve up here. But it would also introduce a tremendous amount of new slack capacity that we don't currently have. And uh, so, you know, our strong suspicion is that all of this slack capacity will not go idle, that, um, that the, the, the gas industry will find a way to use this, they will try to use this to either expand the use of natural gas in the region or they will try to export it. Okay, so there are some drawbacks of, uh, to using uh, a, a large, uh, expensive, permanent uh, piece of infrastructure like a gas pipeline to meet uh, an intermittent um, uh, demand problem that exists for less than 10% of the year. Uh, these pipelines are very expensive um, and, uh, and, and, the, and, the, um, and from the point of view of people who, from, from the point of view of us, the public, who pay for natural gas and who pay for electricity, um, uh, this is, this is, um, this is a very expensive way to solve a problem. It's been, it's been likened to building an eight-way lane highway on Martha's Vineyard to take care of the Fourth of July traffic, uh, not something we would normally think of as as making sense. In addition, you know, when you build pipelines across the land, uh, you wind up uh, having to do eminent domain takings and getting easements from landowners along the path of the pipeline. Um, uh, th all of that reduces property values uh, in, in, along the pipeline. Uh, and, uh, and obviously, if you're a person who's affected by that, it can be uh, anywhere from inconvenient to disastrous <laughs> to, have, uh, to have the gas companies say they want your land. Uh, okay, so there are some other drawbacks. Yeah, yeah. All right, so there's some other drawbacks of using uh, a pipeline as a way to solve this deliverability problem. Um, there are health and safety hazards associated with pipelines, and we'll be talking about that a little bit more later. Um, in addition, uh, building new gas pipelines, when you build a permanent piece of infrastructure like that, you are really planning to go on using that type of, of fuel or that type of energy into the foreseeable future. So you're basically planning to continue with high levels of gas consumption uh, uh, at a time when we need to be drastically reducing our carbon footprint to deal with the climate change problem. Uh, new pipelines would also 
uh, accelerate and, and, and the Massachusetts' current over-dependence on gas to produce electricity, which would, means that you know, natural gas is a fuel that has a, a, a supply and demand marketplace and prices can fluctuate and they can fluctuate for reasons that have nothing to do with Massachusetts. And so if we become, if we go from being, you know, 50% or 60% dependent on natural gas to generate electricity, if that goes up to say 70% or something, you know, we're getting even more exposed to whatever the price of natural gas does in the future. So, all right. Um, all right, so in the fall of 2015, there were two important independent studies commissioned, one by the Conservation Law Foundation and the other by the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office, which studied this problem and concluded that, that new pipeline capacity was the least cost-effective way to deal with uh, this electricity stability problem, uh, and that it also additional gas pipelines would make it impossible to uh, achieve the, uh, the, the, uh, the carbon reduction goals that are embodied in the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2008. Um, so both of these studies say that uh, uh, doing more in the area of energy efficiency, uh, ramping up renewable energy faster, uh, managing demand and supply uh, <coughs> in a smarter way would all of those things would, would deal with our electricity problems more cost effectively than new pipelines would. Um, so, you know, what is the motivation for building these pipelines? Well, naturally, Spectra and uh, National Grid and uh, Eversource and the other industry, they are all companies that are in business to make money. And so, you know, they're part of an industry that quite understandably wants to uh, produce and sell as much uh, natural gas as it can uh, to whoever, as soon as it can, to whoever will pay the highest price for it. And so, you know, we have to understand that, that they have their eyes on being able to export natural gas overseas where prices tend to be much higher than they are, are in the United States. Uh, and so, uh, and in fact, in that, in that arena, there are plans existing uh, to build two um, natural gas export terminals up in Nova Scotia, which would be connected to existing pipeline networks that, that, uh, wh whose direction would be reversed. Um, and uh, and, those pi and the, the investors who are building those, who are planning to build those facilities have explicitly stated that their plans are contingent on getting this Spectra Access Northeast project built. So, you know, what's, you know, what's being sold to us is an attempt to make our electricity supply um, more stable. Well, it might have the side effect of doing that, but in fact, the motivation for doing it, we think, is to enable the exportation of natural gas. Um, so let's talk a little bit about pipeline safety issues. Uh, today, of course, natural gas is not what it used to be. Uh, today, uh, a lot of the gas that is in the pipelines is being produced by a process called fracking, uh, which is uh, short for hydraulic fracturing, and which in which they 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 pump very large amounts, really large amounts of water mixed with uh, a, 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 a kind of a witch's brew of toxic chemicals into the ground at very very high pressures um, to uh, squeeze the gas. Uh, and, and they, they actually, the pressure actually fractures the, the rock formations that the gas is in and, and enables the gas to flow out of these formations. And this is going on most famously in the Marcellus Shale region of Pennsylvania uh, where there is a huge um, uh, fracking industry underway. Uh, some of the, con now they are not actually required to reveal what chemicals they use in fracking because they have an exemption from, from the Clean Water Act um, uh, you know, but, um, uh, you know, that was passed during the Bush administration. Um, and, uh, but some of the, a lot of benzene derivatives, benzene, trimethyl benzene, dimethyl benzene, tetramethyl benzene, uh, naphthalenes, um, the, the, these compounds are both toxic and carcinogenic. Um, it's, these are all things that that are considered environmental hazards if they get into 
if they get in anywhere where, where um, people get exposed to them. Some of the things, some of the effects that they have, um, anemia, decrease in blood platelets, uh, uh, cancer, um, endocrine disruptions, um, uh, <clears throat> nervous system problems, kidney problems, liver problems. Um, so now I want to, you know, I want to point out that this all sounds scary, but it's, it's, it, it, as long as the gas is actually confined in the pipeline and not being allowed into the environment, it's not an immediate problem to people around it. However, there are circumstances where gas does get vented or flared during the normal gas operations. That tends to happen at compressors, compressor stations. They have uh, periodically along a pipeline, they have great big gas turbine compressor engines that, that you know, um, boost the pressure to make the gas flow through the pipeline. And so, um, and then at, when the gas reaches its destination, there are what are called metering and pre pressure reduction stations, which is where they, they, they let the gas flow through some sort of uh, obstacle that causes the the, the, the pressure to be reduced so it can be safely put into distribution mains so that people can use them. Uh, and so it turns out that, that in all of those kinds of operations, there are situations where gas sometimes has to be vented. Um, of gas also gets vented when they, they depressurize the line to inspect it. They, they, they run these, these probes that are called pigs through the pipeline that have cameras and various kinds of sensors on them so that they can inspect the inside of the pipeline and possibly clean it. And of course, you know, the gas that's in the line has to be purged out when they do that. So, um, so all of which is to say that, that, uh, that there are circumstances where these, where these um, unpleasant chemicals can get into the environment. Uh, in addition, pipelines can leak, rupture, and explode. Um, the, the, um, the evacuation zone of almost 2,000 feet on each side of this pipeline that we showed you on the map, they are not joking about that. That really is, if there were a rupture and an explosion, you really would not want to be in that zone. Uh, that is a place not to be. Uh, and uh, basically, what happens is, uh, and these, when, when an accident like this happens, there are, there, are, there are control valves every few miles along a pipeline. Uh, well, and so if it's suppose, suppose it's every five miles. Well, you know, if the, if the rupture happens in the middle of that, it means that they shut down the valves and then all the gas in the pipe, you know, a pipe of that diameter, that's a 30, you know, 30 inch diameter hula hoop. Uh, that's, 24. that's 24. So what we're talking about is 30 inch, so it's bigger than that. Uh, but anyway, all of the gas in that times five miles times 750 pounds per square inch, that's a lot of gas and it's a lot of thermal energy. And all of that is gonna come out and burn if there's an explosion. And we'll show you some pictures of what that looks like. This happened in, back in April in Pennsylvania. This is a 30 inch pipeline that was owned by Spectra uh, that exploded. Um, and uh, uh, <coughs> it, um, it incinerated a house 400 yards away. Uh, the, the owner of the house ran for his life and, uh, and received third de degree burns over 60% of his body. The, the, the radiant heat from this type of fire is so intense that you know, anything for hundreds of yards around can be flashed into flames. Um, here's a 36 inch pipeline explosion back in Texas, um, aerial view of it, which kind of shows you the you know, the, 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 the charred zone around the pipeline where everything got burned and the, the central area where the heat was most intense, the ground has probably been melted together to form glass. Um, so, um, I won't, don't want to, pre to, to say that this happens a lot. This is one of those hazards that happens infrequently, but when it happens, it can be quite devastating. Um, and uh, so, uh, there's, a, there's an organization, um, uh, an agency of the Department of Transportation that keeps track of pipeline incidents. And they, and they are, because the Department of Transportation is responsible for um, 
pipelines uh, along with along with road transport and rail transport, and uh, so they keep stats on incidents uh, and what they cost. And so let's just show the graph. Um, so there is there is somewhat of an up upward trend in the number of in the rate at which incidents happen, um, and that is probably partly because the pipeline fleet is getting older. We, we started to seriously install pipeline, gas pipelines in this country back after World War II. And so there are a lot of pipelines in the ground that are quite old now. Um, and in addition, we're, you know, the industry is building a lot of new pipelines. The, the, the total length of the pipeline network has gone up a lot in recent years. Uh, and so um, you're, you're seeing somewhat of an increase in the, in the rate of incidents now. A lot of these incidents may be, most of them are probably minor, but some of them did cause damage and, 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 and expense. Um, so what does a town have to tell, what, what do the first responders of a town, the fire department, the police department, uh, have to know about pipelines and what to do if there's a pipeline accident like this? And basically, the, the bottom line is all they can do is evacuate people. You, if a pipeline fire starts, you cannot go anywhere near it. And there is no putting the fire out. All there is is, is, is waiting for the pipeline company to turn off the valves and uh, wait for the gas to bleed down and burn off. And um, in the case of that, of that uh, disaster in Pennsylvania that I showed you, um, it took the pipeline company about an hour to figure out which valves to shut off because that pipeline was one of four pipelines in parallel, and they had to figure out which pipeline it was that had the problem and, um, and which set of valves to turn off so that a whole huge region of the country would be not go without natural gas while they fixed the problem. So it took about an hour for them to figure that out, and then it took a total of about four hours for the, um, for the fire to, to burn down. Uh, so, you know, we are told by pipeline companies that, oh, yeah, we, we, have, we have computerized control out of Texas and we can shut these pipelines down um, instantly, and that's not really true in practice. So, so the you know, bottom line of all this is the, you know, the, the, the energy um, sort of powers that be really want this, to build this new infrastructure so that they can expand their markets, sell more gas, and possibly export gas to parts of the world where prices are two to three times as high as they are in the United States. If that, yeah, and if that happens, of course, prices here will rise also. Uh, and furthermore, um, uh, <clears throat> well, that's, that's what will happen here. Um, and so basically, you know, the, the, the risks of this thing in terms of having this, this potentially dangerous piece of infrastructure in our backyard, uh, we get the risks and we really don't get the benefits from this. So, uh, and so now Carolyn's gonna talk a little bit about the climate change uh, perspective on this whole issue. I do this because I'm a mom, because I, ha I want a future for my kids. And so this, is, this part really speaks to me. So I think, I, I hope that, you know, I, are there any climate deniers in here? <laughs> if you don't have to raise your hand, but you know, I can appreciate that it is, um, it is always very hard to understand what's going on when it's not in front of you. But I think this summer, we saw, with the, and what we're continuing to experience in Massachusetts with the, the severe drought that we're having, certainly um, lends itself to, to credibility that we're actually in the middle of climate change, because we are. Um, the Ar Arctic ice is, is, dwelling, is, is dwindling, the glaciers are shrinking, um, you know, things, places are just getting even drier. Is that one? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, here's the uh, average uh, global temperature from um, 1880 to 2010. So you can see that it, it's just on its way up. Um, this, over on the side, that's uh, the, cel the um, Celsius degrees, and you can just see how you know with the Industrial Revolution and actually even before that, 
Um, it goes, well, actually it doesn't show, doesn't go back that far, but I was reading an article recently that uh, it's, it, the planet has been getting hotter even before the Industrial Revolution. Um, yeah. Uh, so here's the atmospheric um, carbon dioxide variations since 1,000. So we're talking over 1,000 years. And you can see this whole kind of hockey stick uh, projection, uh, how just one, once it hits 1,800, it just starts going straight up. Um, and uh, the, let's see if I can do this. Yep. So this, this part right here, this last little bit of uh, before 2,000, is actually this, um, on a, on a larger, on a smaller scale. So you can still see from, uh, to, from um, 1960 up to 2006, this, this is um, 390 uh, parts per uh, million of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And at this, that only goes up to 2006. We are now over 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide. So it's just getting hotter. They, they, they have looked at um, uh, samples of ice. Uh, in, our, in, 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 in both poles, they've looked at trees. They, you know, there there are other methodology. Um, good question. Uh, so the world governments um, had a response last um, December. We had uh, the Paris um, climate talks, uh, and so we have a goal to limit warming to two degrees Celsius with an intent to reach 1.5. Um, to, to keep it below that. Uh, so that implies that we have a, something called a carbon budget. That's the amount of carbon dioxide we can have in the atmosphere that will just, if we keep adding to it, it will just, the planet will just get hotter. Um, and that requires two-thirds to four-fifths of the existing carbon reserves uh, to be left in the ground. Uh, so we need to quick like a bunny in the next 20 to 30 years, um, replace fossil fuels. And it is something that we have gotten really used to, and that is definitely the status quo, and it, you know, it's, it's really turns your head around 180 degrees, but it's something that we're gonna need to figure out. And we, are, we have the technology. Go ahead. So the legislature in Massachusetts passed the Global Warming Solutions Act in 2008, uh, it was an overwhelming vote. It was really amazing and wonderful. Um, they, uh, and this requires the, the, the long term, uh, there are two goals, a 2020, 2025 goal and or 2020 goal and a um, 2050 goal. And uh, the, the long term effort is to reduce 80% uh, reductions uh, in carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, from 1990 levels. It's always really important on what you're basing it on. And so we're saying, okay, we're gonna go from whatever, the, whatever carbon was in 1990, that's what we're gonna aim for. Um, and so we're gonna try to get back down to that by 2050. So, and we have a lot of energy efficiency and renewable um, uh, pro programs in the state to support that. And Governor Baker is, is just, um, last, uh, just on Friday, uh, put out a, um, uh, an executive order saying about some of the things that really uh, echo the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, so the, um, in, just in May, the Massachusetts uh, Supreme Judicial Court ruled that the uh, state was not doing enough to implement the Global Warming Solutions Act, GWSA. And they said that the state government has to reduce its emissions, carbon emissions, year by year by year by year. And they just aren't whistling Dixie. This is law. They really mean it. And so, uh, so the Governor uh, Baker's administration is having to really have to, having to figure out all the different sectors that, that create carbon emissions and how, what, what pieces are we going to work on. Uh, so natural gas is almost pure methane. It uh, forms carbon dioxide and water when it burns. And um, the thing about, you know, we've been told that gas is the bridge to the future. It isn't. It's still a fossil fuel. You can't get, 
You can't get rid of fossil fuels if you're still burning fossil fuels. Uh, it's not, it can't be a bridge because uh, leaked methane, if it goes unburned into the atmosphere, it's 86 times worse as a greenhouse gas. Than, uh, so that makes it over, over 20 years, and that makes it actually as bad as coal. From a climate perspective. From a climate perspective, yeah. Um, go ahead. So uh, to meet necessary climate goals, we just need to, we would have to shut down I mean, these pipelines are expect we the Algonquin uh, pipeline, which was built in 1963, um, and it goes along this area. Um, so it's 53 years old. They, you know, they they expect to have these pipelines last for you know half a century, and but. If they, if they build this pipeline, because of the reducing of the Global Warming Solutions Act, the goals that we have to meet, uh, we would have to shut it down after a, you know, some number of, short number of years. Um, so they, they want to keep it going, and you know, somehow we would have to tell them, nope, you can't. You, you have to turn the spigot off. So, um, and then of course gas being exported uh, will, we all, we all have the same atmosphere, you know, this is just one planet and this is what we've got. And, uh, and so anything that anybody does someplace else in the world is going to impact us, but by the same token, if we can, uh, um, you know, if we don't hold our feet to the fire in keeping uh, global warming to a minimum, you know, it will be just as bad and our exporting to other countries will be just as bad as if we were burning it right here. Um, so what can citizens do? This is the part that is, the, this is the punchline. First of all, there are landowner issues. Um, there are, you know, they, it can, they can lower your property uh, values as much from, as from uh, 10 to 30 percent. Um, you can get an, uh, you, you could be, get a payout uh, for on an easement, um, uh, but you will continue to pay taxes and insurance on that easement. Uh, you can't, when, when you have a, 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 an, an easement, you can't have trees or pools or anything like that, and they, they you know, you, you just, you have to keep that area clear, and if you don't, they will use an herbicide to spray on your, on your property. Um, Spectra um, is going through the Federal Energy Regulatory um, Commission process, and the last the, um, piece is the certificate of, uh, of convenience and public convenience and necessity, and that is a fancy word of saying that they have given approval to the project. Uh, and once they've done that. Uh, if you have um, not worked out a deal with them, they will take your land by eminent domain. Um, and the legal distance from homes is not really dictated by uh, the FERC process. Um, it's, you know, it's, they just have a rule of thumb, and I've, I have known of uh, possibilities of people, uh, pipelines just being, I've, I've seen it go right through somebody's front yard. So. Um, you have uh, certain landowner rights. Uh, you can deny them access to survey. We do have um, forms back there. If you have already given permission to have them survey, um, you, we still have some, uh, uh, for, it's, it's never too late. This is, this is, this is something that, that, well, for me, it's, it's called death by a thousand cuts. You know, if you, if they, all right, so maybe if they've already surveyed your land, um, okay, but it, it, so you might, might feel that it's uh, water over the, you know, under the bridge, uh, but they might have to come back during the process and survey again because they find out something new. And so this gives you an option to say, nope, you can't come back, sorry, you know, you're trespassing. Um, so it's, it's something to consider if you would like to. Um, there are forms over there in the back. Um, uh, let's see, you know, there are separate negotiations with Spectra. If you want, you know, that's a choice. Certainly uh, encourage you to get a lawyer. Um, and uh, the one thing about eminent domain is that if you say, no, I'm not gonna have you, um, 
uh, you know, I'm not going to work out a deal with you. Um, the thing that's good about it, if you could say that, uh, is that you won't have to pay uh, tax and liability um, burdens. So um, what towns can do, you can create pr protective ordinances. Um, there are uh, over in um, uh, Weymouth where they are um, fighting a compressor, uh, compressor station over there uh, because their CONCOM um, had very, very stringent um, rules, stronger than federal and state rules, uh, laws, they were able to say no to spectra and that set in motion a whole raft of, of, of delay for spectra to have to figure out what to do. Um, so ordinances protect your town. If you can figure out a really good ordinance that would really work and, and be, be, be a way to protect your town as well as keep spectra out, you know, that's one way to do it. But you can't, you can't say, I'm making this ordinance to keep Spectre out. That's, that's discrimination. And, uh, but you can say, I, I'm, I'm making, I want this ordinance to protect my town. And by the way, it wind up, may wind up uh, impacting Spectra. Um, you can collaborate as a town in multi-town coalitions. Um, you know, there are both of these long pipelines. Uh, the Q1 loop is uh, over 21 miles. The West Boylston lateral is over 27 miles. And then there are these other towns and we're working on, to, we're starting to um, think about working together. Um, you can share resources and who knows exactly where it would go from there. Um, you can, uh, the town also can be uh, an intervener, as I mentioned earlier at the very beginning, um, the, that's the uh, a special legal status that the town uh, would be wise to take advantage of, because if you don't sign up for that um, in a very short window, it's only 21 days. Um, if you don't sign up for that, when, and it will be coming up in the fall, at least assuming that uh, assuming that Spectra will keep going with what their their schedule has been, which means that they would be filing for formal application with FERC in November, uh, that's it would, it would be about at that time that they would be that there's this window, a 21 day window of opportunity for towns to sign up and um, be interveners, and that gives you it gives the town recourse later on legally. Uh, so. Uh, we're in the pre-filing stage right now. We've already gotten through the scoping uh, section, um, and there will, when the when Spectra files for the their app, files their application with FERC, there will be something called a DEIS. That's a draft environmental impact statement, and uh, there are um, you know there, it's something for town people who live in towns to look at to see how is this really impacting my specific piece of, uh, of this pipeline here. And are there concerns? Have they missed something? Or do you want, you know, is there something that, that you can uh, ask them to go back and study more about or whatever? Um, so there are ways to be able to slow the process down. The, um, the, this, this slide reminds me of the project that, um, ha that got canned last spring, uh, the Kinder Morgan project, uh, the, the Northeast Direct project, which was going all across the, the, width, the, the, the northern tier of the, of the state. It got canned. Because, and they, they just kept working at it and just, at, you know, just being really adamant about asking all the hard questions and they, you know, and keeping customers from, you know, find, trying to restrict customers from, you know, trying to, to keep markets from saying, oh yes, we want to buy, buy the gas from your pipeline. Um, and so it, it eventually got canned. So it is possible to shut it down. Um, there, are, there are other towns that have um, actually uh, made progress in their organizing themselves. Uh, Walpole has passed a resolution. Sharon has passed a resolution against the pipeline. Um, Stoughton has, uh, the selectmen have come out against it. Um, uh, a Kushnet has come out um, against Oh well, they 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 are they're they're putting in an ordinance that will hopefully restrict things. Um, 
uh, there, but there are, you know, the, the people in, in a cushion are really up in arms. They don't want to have two Gillette stadiums full of, of um, LNG. Uh, it's phenomenal to imagine what that would be like. Um, and uh, and and as well as so there 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 are other towns that are getting rolling, and this is the time to get rolling. Um, and we have a website, nospectrama.org. You can uh, have a lot of the same information that we have in the presentation, uh, as well as on the on the the all-purpose flyer. Um, this one, um, that's uh, available. Uh, there's a lot of information there, as well as additional. Um, we have a Facebook page, Greater Franklin Node 350 Mass, and then uh, you can send an email if you have questions. Um, I put some additional ones. 350 Massachusetts is the statewide organization that we're a part of, um, and you know we're, I'm working with climate activists all across the state all the time. And um, no fracked gas and mass where the uh, that was that is the uh, the website that the Kinder Morgan people. Uh, pipeline uh, fighters were uh, using, and it's a f phenomenal resource. Um, Mass Plan is a a um, out in Western Mass, and they are actually suing uh, the right. Currently, they're suing the uh, Department of Environmental Protection um, to deal with the another short, very short pipeline out in Otis, uh, in the Otis State Forest, uh, that would. Uh, to keep that from happening because they'll, they'll chop down uh, trees that are three or three to four hundred years old. It's an old growth forest. So, um, so that's, that's about it. So thank you all so much for coming. You will get another email, uh, you know, to organize this. <laughs>